Okay, so we have some questions. R Ruben, do you want to share? Yes, that's, that was a wonderful review from the th three panelists. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I have a, a question about um, the nature of the relapse, so any one of you could comment. But um, it appears that most of the patients that are going into these are patients with extramedular disease, very, very aggressive disease. And uh, post uh, CAR T, it appears that this, that's the the kind of uh, relapse that we are seeing. Do you have any insight of the change of natural history of those patients? Is there any specific uh, characteristics of those uh, relapse patients? And the second question is in the, in the preparation for the patients who will go into CAR-T. Uh, traditionally, those patients have gone through multiple lines of therapy, and multiple of them are uh, receiving treatment that is toxic to T cells, you know, including melphalan uh, and bendamustin. Um, some uh, patients that you have treated that, I, that, that I've sent you uh, have received those agents with no problems. However, there, there is this uh, rumor that uh, you're, uh, some groups are going to start curtailing on the uh, prior therapies, particularly in those T cell toxic therapies. So if you can comment on that. Uh, in terms of the first question, relapses, I think there's a spectrum of ways in which patients relapse. It is true that we're seeing more extramedullary relapses, but there's a lot more patients with extramedullary disease that go into the study as well. So uh, I think in other settings as well, where the advanced myeloma does present as extramedullary disease, so if the, the CAR T cells are changing the natural history or this is just a reflection of eight or ten prior lines of treatment for some of these patients is going to be harder, but it is true that some of the relapses have been challenging. But there are other patients who have relapsed more conventionally who have been able to go on to other trial, trials as well. So it's not all uh, rapid uh, relapses, with extra, at least in our experience. To your second question about prior therapies, uh, we, at least in the studies that we've done um, at MSK, have not had issues with manufacturing T cells based on prior therapies. Uh, but that said, the quality of those T cells and what the, what the impact of the response might be still to be determined. Almost all of the patients we've treated so far have received melphalan previously and other drugs. And nothing stands out immediately in this very advanced relapse and refractive patient population that a particular drug or, or in, in their prior history would impact the outcomes or expansion of the T cells, at least in our experience. <coughs> I was going to say, in terms of the second question, on the contrary, we actually had a few patients at a different institution who have had bendamustine as part prior therapy before they were having their T cells aphorese, and those patients didn't manufacture their cells very well, and we had to give them a month off and remanufacture them. I think the mechanism of that is still unknown, but you can see that now that CAR-T is moving up earlier and earlier, most of these patients now want to, you know, the plan is to do transplant and then follow by CAR-T. The issue is if you don't collect the cells prior to their, when you're doing the apheresis for the stem cell transplant, the issue is going to be, are you going to be able to manufacture these cells properly post melphalan? Because in myeloma patients, as you know, when you give melphalan, you decrease the amount of stem cells in their bone marrow. So I think that's still, the data still yet to be determined. And, and I'll just comment, we, we also tried to look, and it, these are all small numbers, at whether the s therapy they got right before their uh, apheresis, you know, impacted their expansion or response. We couldn't find anything that was statistically different, but the numbers, I think, are too small. I do have some concern about alkylating agents, you know, right before manufacturing and whether that's going to be something we should avoid, but I think we need to analyze more data. Do you have any other caveats for us in terms of what we should avoid community doctors referring you patients before you're going to be doing this? Is there things they should know about? So because these are available only in clinical trials, the eligibility is quite stringent uh, and very and different for different studies. It's helpful to be involved early on in terms of um, uh, therapies that patients get while waiting for CAR T cells, uh, transfusion requirements, other details, uh, timing of uh, the kinds of treatments these patients get. Uh, every protocol is slightly different, but all of them require measurable disease, all of them require refractory disease, all of them require adequate counts and organ function, uh, and uh, the other challenges, the way these trials are structured and manufacturing processes, slots are not available at every at any given point of time. So when a patient is eligible, there may not be a slot. When there's a slot, the patient's no longer eligible. So it's helpful to be involved early on with referring doctors in terms of different steps in their management so we can hopefully 
uh, maximize the potential for uh, trial eligibility and enrollment. You know, on the back end, I noticed that you guys didn't have any comments, but do you have any thoughts on what you may do on the back end to help allow these T cells to remain or at least work better maintenance type regimens, consolidation, <laughs> thoughts? Because I have a few of my own, but go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, so the short answer is we don't have a lot of data yet. Some of the current trials, though, are allowing IMIDs, for instance, to be used um, as maintenance, so we'll at least have some safety data from there, and uh, there's preclinical data to support their combination. Um, and so that, to me, is one that sort of makes sense. Um, I, I will say we have a very small experience trying to, I guess, reactivate the cars with a PD-1 inhibitor-based regimen post, uh, post progression. This was sort of done on an ad hoc basis, and we looked back. And we saw one patient who re-expanded their cars, but it was very transient, and the rest really didn't respond. So to me, waiting until they progress and their cars are sort of minimally uh, uh, present, it may not be the best time for that type of combo. And there are studies that are looking at using it earlier. But that's the only data that I'm aware of. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, yes, there's one in the back of the room. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, great presentations as a group. Uh, one of the panelists mentioned uh, one of the inclusion criteria, one of the new trials, I think, at Penn, uh, it's a plasma cell leukemia. Do you guys have any experience or know about any patients and results uh, with plasma cell leukemia treated with CAR T cells? Yeah, so I think in our, in our relapse refractory studies, and even in that upfront study, it's more of a history of plasma cell leukemia, but we really don't want them having circulating plasma cells at the time of apheresis, so they have to have had at least in some response and without significant circulating plasma cells. Um, but we have had patients with history of plasma cell leukemia who have then, you know, gotten a response. They've gone into CAR T cells and have responded. Um, it has not been uh, fairly, it has not been as durable in terms of those responses, but it's really anecdotal right now. <laughs>